Hi, welcome to the session. Today we have a very special event here because Dr. Frank Cavico is here with us and I will ask him a few questions about equal employment opportunities and general legal system in the United States so we can get his perspective uh, for a few minutes for managers, graduate students, and obviously business students who are studying about the legal system in the United States. Dr. Cavico, thank you very much for being here and agreeing to uh, share your knowledge with us for our managers, human resource professionals, and obviously graduate students who are studying business uh, in the legal system. Uh, first of all, uh, can you share a little bit about your background, your experiences, why you got into the legal system, why you became a lawyer, and obviously uh, some of the general information about your background? Sure. My pleasure, Dr. Mustafa, and uh, let me say that it's an honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been here at this university and this College of Business for many years, uh, actually 33 years, three years as an adjunct and uh, 30 years as a full-time professor, and I'm currently serving as, a, as an adjunct in the uh, Department of Management where I teach a business law and ethics classes. I came here uh, many years ago from the University of Miami because at the time, uh, the Graduate School of Business here, which was a freestanding school, uh, they wanted to develop a course with an ethics content. And uh, I put together a proposal of a, a combination law ethics type of course in which the law was a government regulation of a, a business type of law, securities regulation, uh, antitrust, actually laws that were created because of unethical business practices such as insider trading, uh, uh, restraints of trade, uh, monopolization. And uh, that course is, is still a, a course here at school today. It's a, a required course in the management department and it's also an elective for our other MBA students. And I also uh, taught through the years here uh, business law of undergraduates and uh, an administrative law and ethics course in the uh, uh, MPA uh, program. Uh, I, I got into a, a, a teaching law because of uh, experiences that I had many years ago in practicing law. Uh, uh, particularly when I saw people being taken advantage of, but being taken advantage of legally. In other words, they were not aware of, of, of the gaps in the law, those moral gaps in which someone, an unscrupulous person with a, a superior knowledge of the law, can take advantage of, of someone lacking that knowledge. Uh, for example, uh, a misrepresentation of the law is not fraud. Someone lies to you about the law, that is not deceit. You can be defrauded into a contract and be bound by that contract even though you're the victim of fraud. Why? Because ignorance of the law is, is, is no excuse. And from that old maxim came the saying, misrepresentation of the law is not fraud. And that was an actual case that I saw. And I remember that many, many years ago still uh, uh, vividly. And, and that's the reason why. Of course, my father's a lawyer, my mother's a teacher, so I mean, I faded to wind up uh, teaching a, a law at the college and the uh, uh, graduate uh, level. Um, also, I, I remember uh, a, a quote I learned in law school from uh, uh, a, a, an English scholar going back to the 1700s, uh, Lord Mainfield, who said the, the purpose of the common law is to protect the weak from the abuse and insults of the strong. And, and, and that, that saying by Lord Mansfield has stayed with me through the years uh, too. So what I do in classes that we're going to do here is we're going to introduce people some basic concepts of, of, of the law, how they apply to a business. Uh, make them know what their rights are, make them know what their responsibility are, and make sure they don't have that level of ignorance where they can be uh, uh, taken of advantage of. So a lot of the law that I do at this level is, is preventive uh, of law, and, and that's been my purpose here through this many uh, years. Okay, excellent. Obviously, you got into the legal system with a really, really good purpose in mind, a good passion, obviously, to help people and to make sure uh, nobody's taken advantage of uh, by anybody uh, in misrepresentation or otherwise. So it's, it's, it's really an important lesson for all of our students uh, to find your passion and then obviously follow it through by knowledge, by accreditation, by obviously uh, learning and reading and becoming one of the top people in the field, as you have done by writing uh, several books in the area of business law, business ethics, and obviously uh, the legal system in general, including many, many very, very good international journal, uh, journal articles that have been written uh, by yourself. So I'll ask you a few questions uh, and if you can share your knowledge uh, with uh, uh, our managers and audience and students, uh, that would be great. So uh, here's the first question. What is your definition of fairness, justice in a legally compliant work environment? Yes, 
in, in essence, I believe that uh, uh, justice means treating equals equally, uh, treating people with uh, a fairness, and most importantly, treating people with respect. That is, uh, treating people as uh, worthwhile human beings in and of themselves and, and not as a mere tool or instrument or, or vehicle or means, and even a, a means to a, a greater end. As I said, uh, uh, people have dignity and they have worth as human beings. Uh, uh, that's how you want to be treated as, as a human being, entitled to dignity and respect, and that's how you should treat uh, other people. And to me, uh, that level of respect uh, that's the essence of, of fairness and, and justice. Okay, and can you tell us a little bit about the legal system in the U.S., more specifically about the purpose and functions of the various branches of the government? Sure. Well, first of all, the U.S. is a, a federal system of government. So we have a, a, a national government we call the federal government, and then we have constituent government elements. We call them states. And within states, of course, we have counties and municipalities. Uh, this was set forth in the U.S. Uh, a constitution which has uh, two basic purposes. One is to set up the government, as I said, a federal system, and then in the Bill of Rights uh, to provide to the people uh, uh, certain rights that they have against government. In other words, a, a government cannot transgress or contravene these rights. And let me mention now, uh, that's an important point because a lot of people are under the misconception that the uh, provisions in the Bill of Rights in the Constitution will protect them from private sector abuse of their rights. That's not the case, particularly in, in employment. For example, a, a government employee uh, can make a case of uh, a First Amendment abridgment of their free speech rights, maybe writing a letter critical of the mayor or somebody or the police chief in the local paper. They may win, they may lose. That's another issue. I'll we'll cover that in administrative law classes. But, you know, you write a letter in the paper critical of your private sector employer. You can scream all you want that, you you know, your First Amendment rights have been violated, but you don't have any uh, First Amendment rights against your private sector employer. So I want to em emphasize that uh, initially. But going back to the major uh, uh, focus of your question, as I said, the government is set up as, as a federal system. Other countries are federal systems, too. Uh, Canada is a federal system. They have a province. We have states. Uh, Mexico is a federal system. Actually, they have states, too. As a matter of fact, Mexico has a federal district. We have the Washington, D.C. Mexico has uh, a Mexico uh, a city. So we're not unique in, in that regard. Uh, and, and that was done, as I said, to diffuse power. Remember, bef before there was a federal government, there were states, and before there were states, there were, were uh, uh, colonies. So uh, a power inherently is vested in the states. However, by means of the Constitution, uh, the states uh, transferred a great deal of their power to the uh, federal government. And so the, the federal government is set up, as we know, in the three branches, the, uh, in Article One of the Constitution, the legislative branch, that's the power to make the laws. And then in Article Two, the executive branch, and that's the uh, power to enforce the laws. There's a famous clause in the Constitution called the Take Care Clause. Uh, the president has the power to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. That's the, as I said, the investigative power, the enforcement uh, power, prosecutorial power, and if need be, you know, enforcing the laws at the point of, of bayonet. And of course, the president is also the uh, commander in chief. And then thirdly, the third branch of government is the uh, uh, judicial branch. The Constitution, however, just created the Supreme Court. The lower federal courts, the courts of appeal and the federal district courts, they were created by, by Congress. And the function of the judiciary, as we know, is to uh, uh, try uh, cases uh, and also to interpret the law, and, and which is very interesting indeed, because uh, uh, right now a, a very important issue will be in Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, there's a prohibition against discrimination based on sex. But does sex mean what sexual orientation, sexual preference? In other words, is gender identity uh, covered under the concept of sex, which is so far, so far has uh, just been interpreted as traditional boy-girl type of sex, although obviously you can have sexual harassment, a male on male, female on, on female. So interpretation is a very, very important uh, role. Uh, and then also, also um, courts have a very important, federal courts, very important power called the power of judicial review. And that's the power to make sure that every law passed in this country, a, a, a local, state, federal law, every law passed in this country or ruled by an administrative agency, all these laws must conform to the Constitution. 
And that power is not specifically granted in the Constitution, but the Supreme Court was sort of arrogated, gave to itself that power in the famous case of Marbury versus Madison when the country was first deformed, and Chief Justice Marshall was the Chief Justice. So those are the three branches of government. And as I mentioned, remember, with federal system, power is diffuse, national government states. And also, on the federal level, power is separated. That's the, the separation of powers doctrine, uh, legislative, executive, judicial branches. And then there are checks and balances, the system of checks and balances between the branches. As we know, has been in the news, the president appoints a justice to the Supreme Court, but it's the Senate that has to confirm him or, or her. Uh, both houses have to pass a law, but, and the president can veto that. However, the uh, uh, members of Congress can override that veto. And then, of course, with judicial review, if a law is passed, the Supreme Court weighs in to make sure that law is constitutional. So you see separation of powers and checks and balances and the Bill of Rights. And you have to remember, historically, the founding fathers of the United States, uh, they were very concerned about uh, too much of a centralized concentration of power, having a very bad experience with the King George. So we have the federal system and, and the separation of powers doctrine. Here's the problem. Three branches of government in the Constitution, but in reality, as the political science people will tell you, there's a fourth branch of government, and that's administrative agencies, not mentioned anywhere in the Constitution. And what has happened through the years as the United States became more technological, a, a more scientific, and, and more complex, Congress, congressmen and women, most of whom are lawyers like myself, political science majors, uh, they didn't have the technical expertise to deal with a lot of these issues. So when someone wants a permit to open up a nuclear plant, well, you know, good luck going to your typical congressman or woman. As I said, they don't know what the requirements should be to open up a, a, a nuclear plant. So through the years, Congress has created administrative agencies like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And, and, and what Congress has done, and it's a very big deal, they have delegated their sovereign lawmaking power that's granted to them in the Constitution. They have transferred that to these agencies that they have created to make laws, laws, in the form of rules and regulations in their respective uh, uh, spheres. A uh, Federal Trade Commission deal with rules dealing with uh, 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 marketing, uh, for example, Environmental Protection Agency uh, for the environment. And then uh, 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 for obviously HR and management people in business, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. However, however, I've got a big footnote here, and that is the EEOC is one of the few agencies that doesn't have the express uh, power, the explicit power to make rules and regulations. As part of the compromise to get the EEOC passed as an agency, uh, the compromise was the EEOC cannot issue rules and regulations, excuse me, cannot promulgate rules and regulations, but it can issue mere guidelines. And I'm putting the word mere in quotation marks because the EEOC has, has, has a, a, a guideline if you violate the EEOC's guideline, the EEOC will sue you. Now, of course, it's a mere guideline, and you take the case to federal district court, and of course, a judge can always uh, overturn that guideline, the powers vested in the judge. However, if you're a small and medium-sized business, you really want to fight the EEOC. So um, most companies look very carefully at those EEOC mere guidelines and treat them as laws, but it's an interesting little twist in the law. But the problem is with, with a, 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 an agency, Agency makes the rules. The FDA has a rule, a fun one, uh, as to how much meat has to be on a frozen meat pizza before you can call your frozen pizza a meat pizza. There's a law. Obviously, a, a Congress is much too busy to deal with how much meat should be in a meat pizza. Remember the old commercial, where's the beef? Well, if you don't think there's enough beef, call the uh, FDA. Be patient, be patient. <laughs> but they will send out an investigator. And if the FDA feels you don't have enough meat in your meat pizza, well, they will proceed against you, not criminally, because uh, uh, agencies don't make criminal laws, agencies don't prosecute. However, what Congress can do is they can take the violation of an agency a rule, like insider trading, and make it into a crime, which Congress did. Of course, you're entitled to due process. You know, you want to fight that, your, your frozen uh, meat pizza case, well, you're entitled to a fair hearing. But where are you going to get it? You're going to get it initially in the agency before an administrative law judge. There's no jury there. The judge decides the law and the facts. Uh, you can't afford an attorney? I'm sorry, life is tough. It's not criminal. It's merely a, a civil. You can be fined. Your, your pizzas without enough meat can be a, a seized. And so the point I'm, I'm trying to make is that in the, in the, the national system, federal system, with the three branches of government, power is diffuse. But in an agency, power comes together. The agency writes the law, the rules and regulation, 
the executive power, the agency enforces the law, investigates and proceeds against you civilly, that's the executive power, and then you're entitled to a due process hearing. Where are you gonna get it? In the agency with an administrative law judge. And a lot of people feel this is very uh, undemocratic, a, a small d, uh, which may be the case. And so the, the issue arises more for political science. How do you control these uh, agencies? Well, you can always appeal an agent decision into the court system, but once again, time, money, and, 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 and effort. And of course, you can always call your congressmen and congresswomen, and uh, uh, remember, they control the budget of these agencies, so that's one way to do it. But uh, I stress this because uh, most of the law that regulates business comes not from Congress, not from the state legislature, but from these specialized administrative agencies like uh, OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. I mentioned the uh, EEOC, Securities and Exchange Commission. And, and many others. That's where the law that regulates business comes from, predominantly. And also this pattern exists at the state uh, state level, uh, too. So business people absolutely have to be aware of, of the rules and regulations coming from these agencies and the fact that they are law in the EEOC. They're very strong guidelines. Uh, what are some of the common mistakes that firms and managers make that gets them into trouble with the laws in the United States? I think initially it would be say uh, uh, being ignorant of the law, but that certainly can be remedied by by, by legal uh, training. Uh, uh, that's that's one thing, and also uh, being, as I said earlier, uh, ignorant of, of some of the the moral gaps uh, in the in the law. Uh, also, the law gives you options. People have to be aware of that. You can merge, but the merger has to pass the the merger test of the Clayton Act. You remember Staples and Office Depot merged, and uh, uh, now they were forced to uh, uh, unmerge. So I think there's that, that level of, of uh, ignorance of, as to the law, which I said can be, be remedied very well with the appropriate types of, of uh, a training. And also I tell people, you know, we go back to fairness. You, you, you treat people fa fairly, you treat them well in a non-discriminatory fashion, treat equals equally, you treat them with uh, uh, respects, you have emphasis on, on, on legal training, perfect, particularly preventive law, knowing your rights and, and responsibilities. You shouldn't fall into that that trap of acting uh, illegally. So I said, knowledge is power. Uh, uh, knowledge of knowing something and, and being, you know, forewarned. What's still saying, uh, to be forewarned is to be a, a forearm. So it's a matter of education, which, as I said, I've spent my life doing undergraduate and, and graduate level, as well as seminars uh, for business people, letting them know what their rights are and what their responsibilities are under the law. If students are taking business law one and business law two, would that be sufficient if they really apply the knowledge in the workplace to stay out in trouble for the most part? Yeah, if you have a basic conception of, of traditional business law uh, uh, material, you know, elements of a contract, of, of, of a tort, of products liability, uh, if you have a, a, a basic knowledge of, of, of corporation versus a partnership versus a limited liability company, which is very the way to uh, do business these days, particularly for a, a small entrepreneurial firm starting out. But you also need, a, a particularly for business managers, you really need some exposure to graduate level, as well as it could be handled in an upper level undergraduate course, government regulation of business subjects. That's you know a, a, antitrust. So for example, you're at a trade association meeting and you're having a casual uh, a discussion and all of a sudden the discussion turns to what a uh, pricing, pricing, and perhaps you're contemplating uh, uh, some agreements of pricing. Well, that is very serious antitrust language. That could be construed as horizontal price fiction, which is a per se, meaning automatic violation of the law. And there are civil and criminal ramifications to that. So you better be, you know, have knowledge of that fact and, and tell people that talk comes up. Obviously, you get yourself out of that conversation. If it comes up in a meeting, you object to that talk. You know, you, you don't have to be melodramatic about it. So I don't think we should be talking about this. We should consult with our attorneys and get it on the record that uh, you uh, object. So I think that's very, very important. And, and to know some, some of the basics of um, uh, insider trading, which is clearly a, a legal wrong. And you'd be surprised you know, uh, on a regular basis, fortunately not a lot of students, but students that don't work for a company, they say, you know, I know something bad is gonna happen in my company. You mean I can't sell my stock? And oh my goodness, no, you can't sell your stock. That's a felony to sell your stock. So as I said, and I, I keep on harping on it, but it's been my, my life's work, and, and that is to uh, educate people as to their rights and responsibilities. Let's say stay out of trouble. Let's talk a little bit about what managers need to do to make sure that their employees do not experience illegal discrimination in the workplace. And also, if you can tell us, what's the difference between 
disparate treatment versus disparate uh, impact forms of discrimination. Right. Once again, it goes to education, as I said, for upper level management and, and then to uh, uh, train the employees as to some of the basic uh, concepts of, of uh, a non-discrimination law. Of course, you know, as I said, come back one of the first points that I made, if you treat people with respect, if you treat them as valuable, worthwhile human beings, you really, you're not going to have any, any serious legal problems. Uh, I, I firmly believe in that. And, and that's actually basic ethics, even you know, superimposed on the, uh, on, on the law. But you need that, you need that level of, of training. Uh, for example, uh, you know, employment application, you have a little box, have you been convicted of a felony? and uh, applicant checks that off, you summarily uh, exclude that application. Well, someone should be trained, the legal should train up a level management, train HR people that that's not acceptable as far as the EEO, uh, EEOC goes. The EEOC says uh, certainly you can uh, consider people's criminal backgrounds, but later on in the application process, uh, because uh, the what they were convicted of may have been many years ago. They've been very good citizens too. They're now even in Florida, they, they can vote. Uh, because of that, they rehabilitated themselves. And, and also what they were convicted of, maybe convicted of possession of marijuana, God knows how many years ago, uh, uh, that's not really a, a, a relevant today after such a long period of time. They've been working steadily, a family, education, that counterbalances that. Obviously, if they've been convicted recently of child abuse, you may want to know that, and, and, and that certainly would preclude someone from being a child care a worker. But as I said, that's something that management should be aware of and, and should impart to you know uh, human resource uh, uh, professionals. And also, uh, you know, you think this would be done, uh, uh, but I, I see cases that, for example, under Title VII, the Civil Rights Act, when it comes to uh, a religion and, 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 and disability, there's a, a double duty. There's, there's a duty not to discriminate, but there's also a duty to make a reasonable accommodation to the uh, religious needs, beliefs, and practices of an employee, uh, uh, as, as well as to a disabled employee. And you're surprised, as I said, fortunately not too many, but regularly see cases that there's ignorance. Uh, I, I don't think there's, there's any kind of hostile animus, but people just don't know that they, they're obligated to make a duty. I mean, there are some parameters. If the duty involves an undue burden uh, 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 or undue hardship. The duty to accommodate is, is, is not required. But as I said, I, I, I see that. I go, you know, send me to EEOC.gov in the news. I'm there, how, you know, how could this happen? The, the examples I gave are very basic. So once again, it comes back to education. As, as to your other point, under Title VII, right, there's two ways of proving uh, a discrimination. Uh, one is uh, a disparate uh, a treatment. Uh, uh, this is purposeful uh, discrimination based on note the protected categories, you know, a, a race and color, religion, uh, national origin, and, and, and gender. Uh, the problem here is that for the aggrieved party, you need some evidence, not a lot as far as the EEOC is concerned, but you need some evidence of a, a, a hostile animus, a discriminatory intent, that you have a bad mind, that uh, someone didn't get the job, they didn't get the position, the promotion, or they were discharged because of an impermissible uh, a, a reason. Uh, however, the evidence can be direct evidence, you know, uh, we're going to hopefully have a witness, but actual case, you know, we, we don't need any little girls uh, driving these big rigs, you should be home having babies, uh, you know, baking cookies, something like that. Or a case in which um, a, a, a company had a policy, uh, do not bring your child to work day. We talk about whether that's uh, uh, acceptable or not. I can see there may be some good reasons just having machine drive. Anyway, and a male employee uh, brought uh, his kid to work and he was suspended for that. And a woman employee, she brought her daughter to work. She was fired. So all of a sudden we have what, disparate treatment based on a protected category, gender. But circumstantial evidence, indirect evidence can be used. Uh, for example, a minority, uh, uh, applies for a job, uh, the minority is qualified for the job, uh, a minority member is not hired, the job remains open, and the job is given, let's say, to a white male. That's enough for the EEOC. And then what happens a lot of these cases, the, the burden is shifted back to the employer to come up with a legitimate job reason as to why did you hire this person? Why did you fire uh, this person? And also, an interesting body of law deals with code words. A code word can give rise to an inference of intent. <clears throat> the classic case, actually it's the main case, the leading case, is a Supreme Court case 
in which it wasn't a code words case, it was a code word case. A very brief Supreme Court decision was one word, and a, a black employee wanted to be a supervisor, and, and a manager uh, denying him the supervisor position called him boy. And the Supreme Court said, based on our, our, our history, you know, some very sad of race relations in the United States, that was enough to raise an inference of discrimination. And if that could not be rebutted, uh, uh, then we have a civil rights violation. Now, disparate impact, sometimes called adverse impact, that's different because there, there's no intent to discriminate. That's not required. In a disparate ad or adverse impact case, the employer has a, a neutral uh, a policy and the policy is applied to all employees. But the result of, of that policy is that a, a disparate or disproportionate adverse impact is created on a group of minority employees, uh, minority race or, or, or women. And uh, as I said, there's, there's uh, uh, lots of cases uh, dealing with uh, uh, adverse uh, uh, or disparate uh, uh, impact. For example, one locally here in Florida was a, a community uh, had a, a requirement that all police officers had to be able to swim for about 50 yards but without your shoes, but in, in full uniforms, a beach community. And guess what? Who was disproportionately failing that test? Black police officers. And, and apparently, and actually it's a very interesting area uh, to explore uh, because of, uh, of slavery in the United States and, and, and the, uh, and the old separate but equal doctrine in which you could have segregated pools and facilities one for the white kids and one for the black kids. The problem with the pool for the black kids, there's no water in it. I mean, that was, it was a joke, a cruel joke. This facility is supposed to be separate but equal. They were certainly not equal for the black kids. Anyway, that being, that being the point, there was a, a, a federal civil rights lawsuit threatened based on the adverse impact theory. Unfortunately, it was settled and the compromise was, and this is what managers should, should do, this is obviously public sector with the police force, and they came up with the compromise, and the compromise was, look, you're, you're a, a candidate and you're black for a, a police position in this community. You've passed every exam, but you can't swim. Guess what? There's the pool, there's your trainer, and you've got the six months to learn how to swim, which I think is a very fair and, and respectful uh, a way to uh, handle the uh, situation. But I remember the, um, uh, the box on the application. Have you been convicted of a felony? Well, the EEOC said that has a disparate uh, impact on, 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 on black employees in, in, in South Carolina. And the cases are involved, in, and, and they're litigating it, uh, uh, this, the EEOC. They can, obviously, uh, BMW and Dollar General have the, uh, the legal resources to do this. But the EEOC said that had a disparate impact. Uh, which it may have. Uh, 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 we'll, we'll see what the, that goes ultimately to the Supreme Court. But remember, to be fair to a, a Dollar General and, and, and also to BMW, there's no evidence that they intentionally discriminate against black employees. Actually, I think both of them, if I remember correctly, they have a majority of black employees in their workforce. So they're, they're not evil discriminatory companies, but it's the neutral policy that has the effect. And you see this with firefighters, women disproportionately failing the test, but you have to be able to lug, what is it, the dead body pull? You've got to be able to do that. For a flight attendant, you have to be a certain height. Uh, uh, what happens here? If there is a, a, an adverse uh, impact, that doesn't mean that the, the aggrieved parties prevail. It means that the burden is shifted back to the employer. And if the employer can come up with a legitimate a job related reason for this neutral policy, then the neutral policy will stand, not discrimination. And the case never went to court. As I said, it was compromised. The swimming case, I'm thinking, well, your police community probably can make a pretty strong argument that it's a business necessity, of course, it's public sector, a business necessity for a police officer in the beach community to be able to swim 50 yards. But as I said, that case was a, a, a fortune solved. And you see the same thing with the strength test and, and agility a, a test, too. The communities try to uh, justify them. What's interesting, and this is uh, another little footnote, is, is that they're saying that some of the tests are unfair because of uh, like the fire, because they give too much emphasis to men's muscles as opposed to women's, but I'm getting way out of my, uh, way out of my field now. But it's very interesting, but it, it's, it's an irony testing and job requirements, very important for HR managers, but you always have to worry about, remember I said ignorance is, uh, uh, is an excuse, but ignorance of the law is no excuse. We don't want uh, people to be uh, ignorant. So they have to be aware of that adverse impact theory. Uh, can a manager of a large private for-profit organization and not hire someone based on uh, the candidate's gender, skin color, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, in or disability? Okay. 
Well, we have Title VII of the uh, Civil Rights Act that uh, prohibits that type of discrimination. However, as I said, you need evidence. Uh, and then if there is discrimination, there has to be some type of business justification or, or, or need. There is one area that is important and that is an area of legal discrimination. This is the BFOQ doctrine, bona fide occupational qualification doctrine, which allows discrimination, first and foremost, never on race or color, but will allow discrimination based on the uh, other categories. Uh, uh, for example, a, a religion, not to be frivolous, but if the Catholic Church wants to hire a priest, they can say they must be Roman Catholic, all right? right. Uh, but uh, the BFOQ, as I said, uh, uh, is disfavored by the courts because it's legal uh, uh, discrimination. But if a, a certain characteristic is uh, a reasonably necessary uh, for normal and successful job discriminations, then an employer is allowed to discriminate based on those characteristics. So, you know, you go to Disney and you go to uh, uh, Epcot, well, you know, uh, those uh, uh, positions are gonna be filled by people of those countries. All others need not apply. And also, uh, an interesting uh, situation, in uh, Harambe, the African village at uh, uh, Disney, uh, they had some uh, uh, Italian American kid wanted to apply uh, uh, for a customer contact position, they, and they said uh, no. Uh, uh, he's being discriminated because of his national origin, Italian American. But they said if you want to work in Harambe and, and a customer contact position, uh, you must be African. But no, Disney said Mickey said African, which means what? Not African American. Because I guess they want to represent and they want to bring Africa to life, and I guess even if you're a black kid and, and you know you study in Africa, you speak a little Swahili, you spend some time there, whatever, that's not good enough for Mickey. Mickey says Africa. Mickey means Africa. And then the interesting thing is, you go to Harambe and you see some white kid there and say, "What's this white kid doing here?" Well, where's this white kid from? South Africa, which is part of. Africa, I remember race and color can never be BFOQs, but uh, a, a gender certainly can. There was a leading case, and I gotta give this woman credit, she wanted to be a prison guard in Alabama at a maximum security male prison, and she wanted to be a contact guard, like, you know, our back in your cell, or we're tossing the cell for search. And, you know, the, the, the Supreme Court said, uh, uh, you know, we, we commend your ambition, <laughs> you got a lot of guts, lady. But uh, in order to be a, a contact prison guard, a maximum security male prison, you must be male. Of course, there's lots of other positions for it, the criminal justice system, not that one. But that's an extreme case, but it makes the point that courts don't like BFOQs. Uh, 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 Hooters was involved in BFOQs, and, and they managed to settle with the EOC, if you remember that controversy. So, uh, uh, you know, God bless America, but if, if, for a Hooters girl, you still have to be a girl. But the compromise was uh, they had to open up other positions at, at Hooters for, uh, for men, like, you know, bartenders and ancillary uh, 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 positions. But that case was never litigated. That was more of a publicity campaign and, 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 a, and, and a very good one by Hooters in, in trying to combat the uh, uh, EOC. But as I said, a, a lot of in the old days, you wanted to be an engineer on a cruise ship. You had to be male. Well, of course, you can be a female now. Oh, it'd be separate quarters and this and that. And the court said, "Well, you spend a little money to give the women the opportunity." Or if you want to be a a, a, a nurse in a maternity ward, you have to be a female. Well, now there's male nurses at maternity wards. But as I said, you want to treat people with respect. So maybe for religious reasons, someone who's about to give birth, uh, maybe you can find you know a, a, a woman nurse to take care of that person. I said, a lot of this is also uh, social stereotyping, gender stereotyping. The law doesn't like BFOQs, uh, uh, but they do exist, and it is legal discrimination, so be very careful with that. Uh, can a manager of a large private for-profit organization not hire someone based on the candidate's body size or looks? Okay. Two different issues there. With body size, if a, a certain body size is critical to the efficient operation, of, or like for a plane, for a flight attendant, you cannot be too big <laughs> for safety reasons. But you have to worry, uh, uh, or for a model, you modeling clothes, you know, obviously you have to be very, very uh, 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 thin. I mean, might be too thin, but that's another issue, the, the young girls. Uh, you have to be careful though with body size because the body size might be due to some kind of medical condition. 
and that will bring in the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. So you have to be careful with a, a, a body size, uh, thyroid condition, perhaps I'm not a not medical person, uh, but there's more leeway uh, with body size, uh, as I said, if it's not medically uh, oriented. Uh, now with, with looks, there's a lot more leeway here, although as always you have to be careful. In other words, you can discriminate against people because you feel they're not pretty enough to work at your firm or they don't have a certain look or style or class. They're not sexy enough. They're not hot enough or, or, or whatever, for whatever the position uh, is. They have to have a certain uh, a look. That's legal. Whether it's moral or not, that's another issue. And they'll save that for another day. But that is legal. You're not attractive enough to work at this company, whatever, for whatever reason. Uh, the problem is if appearance can be tied to a protected category, now it's not appearance discrimination, which is legal, but it may be discrimination based on a protected category. So you have a no beard policy, like which uh, Publix had until recently, and, and, and they changed it, I'm digressing a little bit, uh, because they need employees, and you know if they were an employee with a beard could do the job, it's, it's not going to detract from whatever the Publix's uh, uh, image is. But if someone's beard is tied to their religion, perhaps, or maybe you have a Sikh with, with, with a, a, a turban, uh, but that's what has to be done to convert a, an, an appearance case in, in which someone has no recourse legally into a, a Title VII discrimination case. You have to tie the appearance to one of the protected uh, categories. Good examples there. And I was thinking of uh, that's right. Example. That's right. They, uh, 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 they want the, the preppy look, uh, the, the all American look, and, and there's nothing wrong. You, know, so you don't have the preppy look, you're not working here. But the problem was the, the preppy look, they were just hiring kids, you know, blonde hair, blue eyed kids. And if you know a black actor, they put you back in the stock room. They got into a lot of difficulty for that. They eventually uh, uh, settled. Uh, as the Joe Strong, Stonecraft, where you had to be a, 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 a male to be a server. I'm, I'm digressing a, a, a bit. Although, remember, the women still have to pass the strength test. You still got to have those overpriced the stone crab legs. You still have to do that. Uh, so you can have a preppy look. Uh, 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 that's permissible, but it can't be used to discriminate against, against black because both black boys and black girls can have a what a, a preppy look, or however. Uh, that collegiate look, however you want to uh, uh, define it, as opposed to what is the United Colors of Benetton. They took the opposite approach. They made a marketing campaign of people of all different backgrounds and, and, and colors. It was a wonderful marketing campaign uh, highlighting the uh, diversity of this world and also diversity of, of their workforce and maybe the diversity of their uh, uh, clientele, their customers. And as I said, it's good, smart, ethical uh, 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 reasons uh, uh, to act in a, in a moral manner, in this case, by uh, accentuating diversity as opposed to that other company, uh, which, uh, as I said, emphasized the very unique, you know, as I said, all American blonde blue hair uh, look to their detriment legally. Any final suggestions for managers and obviously human resource professionals uh, and graduate business students uh, who want to create a fair, ethical, and sustainable, and inclusive work environment for all of their employees and they want to be legally compliant? Uh, first and foremost, I, I would say, since we're in a business environment, I would say it's it's the right thing to do to create this, this fair environment. It's also the smart thing to do. And you have to take a, a long-term perspective. So you want to have this legal training, as I've been emphasizing. You want to have training on, on diversity. You want to have training on, on sensitivity. You want to have a code of ethics that goes above and, and beyond uh, uh, the law. Uh, you want to do this because it's the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do. It's in your own self-interest as a company and as, as a manager of, of a company to have this uh, 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 atmosphere, uh, uh, this uh, corporate culture of legality and, and, and morality. And also, as I tell the students, it's also good to be in a prudent manner, socially responsible, get involved in the community in, in a charitable way as well as to be environmentally responsible. I mean, you know, above and beyond the law, obviously you're gonna be environmental laws, but you also make some efforts to, you know, conserve energy, conserve water. So, as I said, it's, it's in, in the self-interest, as I said, individually and, and, and from an organizational standpoint, they have this level of, of, of legal knowledge, but, uh, but the, the legal knowledge actually uh, uh, working uh, in tandem with, as I said, ethics and morality, uh, uh, diversity, uh, uh, sensitivity, uh, uh, training, uh, codes of ethics, which are legitimate codes of ethics, not window dressing. And so the idea is you want to act in, in, in a legal manner, 
but knowing that there are, are moral gaps sometimes in the law, so you want to make sure that you act not merely in a legal manner, but you also act in, in a moral manner, and then in, in a prudent way, be uh, uh, socially responsible and, and sustainable. And, and always when we talk about uh, uh, ethics and morality, as I said, I think the hallmark is treating people with respect. And for a manager, not just uh, uh, treating uh, the employees that work for you as well, obviously customers and clients with respect, but uh, for a manager, uh, you want to be a mentor, you want to be a coach, you want to empower people, you want to make them part of, of your team. And, and they will benefit, but you as a manager will benefit too. So uh, in essence, what it comes down to for me is, is education and respect. Sure, all of our audience will benefit from uh, the excellent suggestions uh, so they can treat all their employees with respect and dignity and obviously be legally compliant, compliant in all their dealings. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. It's been, been my pleasure. Thank you all.